Uh, well, I'm, I'm Charlie Barton and <laughs> I was born in Britain, came out to Australia first in 1974 to study at the Australian National University. Uh, completed that in 1978, uh, travelled overseas a fair bit, came back to Australia in 1984 and been here ever since. So uh, as a scientist, my background is in the Earth's magnetic field. My early research was on uh, looking for long-term variations of the magnetic field as recorded in uh, sediment columns, lake sediments and marine sediments. And uh, that led to an interest in the Earth's magnetic field and uh, became involved uh, with the South Magnetic Pole and the various exploits to uh, reach the South Magnetic Pole. Um, the geographic poles are what everybody is very familiar with and uh, these define the rotation axis of the Earth so they're diametrically opposite. Uh, the magnetic poles are formally defined as the principal points on the Earth's surface where the magnetic field is precisely vertical down at the north and up at the southern end. And uh, they don't coincide with the rotation poles and the reason for that is that uh, the magnetic poles really need to be thought of as a phenomenon and not as a location. And uh, they result from uh, motion of molten iron in the Earth's core. And the molten iron moves around, uh, creates electric currents, and those currents produce a magnetic field. So the movement of the molten iron in the northern hemisphere controls the position of the north magnetic pole. And likewise, uh, the southern uh, fluids uh, control the south magnetic pole. So that leads to two consequences. Uh, one is that uh, the two poles uh, can move and they don't necessarily move together. And the present time, for example, both magnetic poles are moving northwards. The uh, north magnetic pole is going northwards about 50 kilometers a year and the south magnetic pole at a bit less than 5 kilometers a year. That's the steady drift of the magnetic poles. But also, um, the superimposed on that steady drift from year to year is a uh, daily motion. And that arises from uh, effects on the sun, surprisingly, that um, the um, radiation received from the sun, particle radiation, disturbs the, uh, the ionized layers on the outside of the Earth in the, the uppermost atmosphere at an elevation of about 100 kilometers. And uh, the effect of that is to produce electric currents outside the Earth. And again, those currents produce a magnetic field, and that magnetic field shifts the magnetic poles. And it produces a, a daily motion of the magnetic poles, which is related to the uh, rotation of the Earth beneath the Sun, of course. So, uh, and that can be quite large. Um, so on a, a quiet day, when the Sun's not disturbed, then it might be as little as 20 kilometers in a day. But on a disturbed day, it could be anything up to a thousand kilometers. So in order to uh, determine the location of the magnetic pole with the sort of observational techniques available to us, you have to be lucky. You have to be there on a day which is not disturbed. And they're quite rare in Antarctica. Well, my first exposure to the uh, quest for the magnetic pole uh, came from an invitation by Dick Smith, who's been a sponsor of this kind of uh, exploration science for many years. And uh, he was running a flight over the Antarctic, one of the first um, semi-commercial tourist flights from Australia in 1977. So I was appointed as the geomagnetic expert to go on that flight, which was very fortunate and a great experience. And uh, so in the course of reading uh, about the magnetic pole, I discovered several things of note. Um, the first was that uh, nobody had actually reached the magnetic pole exactly. Several people had tried, and the, the earliest attempt, serious attempt, uh, which got quite close, was James Clark Ross in uh, 1841. Um, he, of course, was the first person to reach the North Magnetic Pole in, 19, in 1832. So, and then um, the other thing which we discovered was that uh, the magnetic pole, when it was first located by that famous uh, Edgeworth David, Douglas Morse and Alistair Mackay expedition 
in 1909, they reached the magnetic pole, uh, which they thought they'd reached in uh, the 16th of January that year. Um, uh, the, the magnetic pole was high on the Antarctic plateau, but uh, it appears that it's now drifted out to sea. So um, this, this struck me as rather interesting. So uh, we developed a technique in 1985 for um, measuring the magnetic uh, position of the magnetic pole from a vessel at sea. The problem then, of course, is how do you measure the Earth's magnetic field when it's completely dominated by the magnetic field of the ship? And that method was tested in 1986 successfully and demonstrated to work. There were a couple of other less successful uh, demonstrations of the technique and the best opportunity came in the year 2000 when I went down with uh, Don McIntyre on the Sir Hubert Wilkins, again funded by Dick Smith Foods in this case. And we had uh, all the conditions were just right for us. We had a, a small vessel, we had good observing equipment, uh, the weather was pretty good, <clears throat> and most important of all, we happened to hit conditions when the sun was not disturbed and observing conditions were as near perfect as you can get. So the, the story of uh, our approach to the pole was quite interesting because we commenced observations several days away from the pole. The ship could only travel at a maximum of eight knots, so we were travelling quite slowly and under magnetically disturbed conditions. The magnetic pole could move faster than we could. So uh, we did a, a set of observations, determined where the pole was, decided on an intersecting path and then made further measurements as we went along. And in the first couple of days the magnetic pole was moving away from us as fast as we could go. We weren't making much progress. And, and then we were very fortunate the magnetic pole basically stopped still and we were able to catch up and uh, positioned the ship right in the middle of where the magnetic pole was moving around and made a succession of observations, the closest of which was 1.6 kilometers. So um, you can never stipulate that you've been exactly at the magnetic pole, but that was as close as anybody has ever managed to get to it. So we consider that we did get to the magnetic pole. Well, humbling, really. Uh, you feel as though you've sort of sneaked in through the back door and we, we drank champagne at the moment when we uh, found the magnetic pole and had a, a pretty good dinner afterwards, too. So compare that with the exploits of the, the true explorers, of course, it doesn't really rate. But in terms of, of actually doing the job uh, with the best available equipment, uh, then we did better than anybody else and we were lucky. So we, we can claim some degree of fame, but we didn't go through the same deprivations that the others had to. I think uh, for anybody who has any sort of interest in the Earth's magnetic field and uh, polar exploration, then this, this exhibition here at the uh, South Australian Maritime Museum is one of the most outstanding exhibitions I've ever seen. Um, I've done a fair bit of reading on the subject and I've learnt an awful lot of new stuff by coming to this exhibition. The, uh, the wealth of different artefacts, uh, objects which have been used during these explorations, the, exploration, the explanations about the, uh, the magnetic pole, uh, a demonstration of where a magnetic pole is and what constitutes a magnetic pole, are just superb and I, I think anybody would have a, a very, very enjoyable afternoon or a day at the exhibition, I said.